Well, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome everyone today to our fourth live question and answer session. Um, welcome everyone. I think a few people last, a few people are joining. So just hold on for one second. Um, this evening we, we've got um, the wonderful Elvira, Matthias and Gerben who, who run and own the beautiful tall ship with Siskelde and myself representing the Darwin 200 side. So the objective tonight is to give you a bit of an overview um, of the project. We've got, following on from last week's, last month's session, we've got the next eight legs as an overview to show you some of the highlights of those legs. Um, we've also got some exciting news that we're launching the online community pages. And of course, then we open the floor to all questions and answers. So it's anyone's opportunity to put forward any questions at all whatsoever uh, to the wonderful Esther Skilde team or, or myself from the Darwin 200 side. So um, my name is Stuart McPherson. I'm the project leader of Darwin 200. I'll hand over to Elvira. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Elvira. I work uh, in the office of the Oosterschelde. So probably you uh, received maybe an email from me or you talked to me on the phone. Um, so I can tell you a lot about the booking side of stuff and things. Uh, how it all works on board. So I look forward to all your uh, questions. And then um, I think I work together with Matthias. So maybe Matthias can explain. Yeah, it. I'm uh, uh, the newest member of the team working uh, at the Oosterschelde office for, well, I believe six months now. Yes. And it is truly, uh, it's wonderful to be involved in such a project and uh, well, to answer your questions, to, uh, to welcome you on board. No, it's uh, really great. Well, and my father is uh, well also working uh, in our team, but he is uh, currently on the phone with one of our captains, so he will be joining and introducing himself uh, later. Perfect. All righty. Well, if if everyone's happy, um, so we could start the, the evening this, this evening with the, the next overview, following on from last month's, with legs nine to sixteen. So just a reminder to everyone, every single session is recorded and on the Darwin 200 and Dutch Tourship.com websites. So if you want to watch the previous sessions, um, they're all live, they're all on YouTube. Just search also the Darwin 200 YouTube channel and you'll see them all on there as well. Um, so each month we add new information and we add, um, yeah, basically new, new, new points concerning the voyage. So if everyone's happy, um, I'll start with a quick 10 minute overview of the next eight, eight legs. So we're doing four question answer sessions with eight each. This is the second of those four. So if it's okay with Elvira, I'll just share my screen and hopefully you can then see my presentation. Okay. Is that coming through okay? Can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay, beautiful. Okay, all righty. Okay. Well, following on from last 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 month, when we looked at legs one to eight, um, just the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'll give you a super quick overview of some of the highlights of legs nine to 16. Again, you can watch the preceding eight online. Uh, we've got a recording online. I, I really should emphasize that, that these presentations that I do each month are about the ports. I'm just showing you some of the highlights of the, the start and end points, but obviously, I can't show the amazing things that you'll see at, at sea on the ship as we sail around because obviously you, you opportunistically see whales and, and beautiful landscapes and beaches and so forth um, as we're sailing. So this is really about the start and the end, but I really don't want to overstep emphasizing the middle as well, which is of course the sailing in between these places, which is the whole point of the, of the voyage legs. So last week, last month, sorry, um, we ended with leg eight in Puerto Santa Cruz, uh, down at the tip of South America. So this, this next leg, which is leg nine, involves sailing from Puerto Santa Cruz across to the Falkland Islands, um, to the little capital Stanley. Um, I have to say I have a particular connection with the Falklands. I, I filmed a BBC documentary there, and it, it more than anywhere, on I think, on the entire itinerary, it's the place that I'm most desperate to go back to. It's a magical place that is completely misunderstood. Um, everyone thinks it's just rainy and full of sheep and, and not that interesting. But honestly, it's one of the best wildlife secrets and one of the most exciting places. Honestly, I can think of it, and it really is. 
I'm not just trying to promote the Falkland Islands. Anyway, um, this voyage leg is, is just over a week or so. Um, and obviously we have the adventure of sailing from, from continental South America to the Falklands archipelago. As you may know, the Falklands is made up of two main islands, East and West Falkland, and about 800 smaller islands that form an archipelago, um, home to some of the, the, really some of the greatest wildlife concentrations uh, around South America. Um, it has about 3000 inhabitants, the majority of which are in Stanley. I've never understood it. Newspapers and magazines always call it Port Stanley, but as far as I'm aware, there's no official name that calls it Port Stanley. It's, it's always, it's Stanley. Um, but it's a really interesting place. It's a really colorful little town at the end of the world. It's about roughly 200 years old and it's home to just over 2000 people, which is about two thirds of the, the population of the islands. Um, when I went the last time, there was big minefields from the Falklands War at those hills at the back. But since I've been, they've all been removed. Um, so it, it's come, kind of come, and, come out of the shadow of the war, which obviously right now it's 40 years anniversary from when that happened. The Falkland Islands is a fascinating place. It was settled really as, a, as an outpost for ships going around the Capes and as a, as a, as a estantheus for horses and, and sheep farming. And it has a very rugged, wild west sort of little house on the prairie vibe to it as you go in in towards port stanley you can pass you know many famous shipwrecks including this one which you you can't miss uh from from anywhere in stanley it's called the lady elizabeth um and um, there are many other wrecks it's actually this is where the very famous ship by brunel the ss great britain this is where the, it was recovered it sank here near, near stanley and it was floated as, as you may know and brought back several decades and it's one of the most important steel hold metal hold vessels anyway the islands really are a treasure trove they're home to five species of penguins basically you can see all of the great stuff in south georgia and antarctica here in the falklands without really going on uh, without having to, to worry about rough seas and, and massive massive oceans and journeys and so forth down to antarctica so it's a brilliant place and we've deliberately budgeted in several days on the journey over to hopefully explore and, and land at some islands, obviously weather permitting. We, we specifically added a, a few days into the itinerary. There are still some places left on this leg. And again, I'm definitely gonna be there myself <laughs> as, a, as a paying customer as well, because it's such an exciting and amazing place. So yeah, five species of penguins, including king penguins, the second biggest in the world, I, I believe from memory. Lovely rock hoppers, which are quite widespread across the islands. And it actually, this is a little known secret, it has the largest populations of albatrosses on Earth. Um, the largest one occurs on an island called Steeple Jason, and it's home to black browed albatrosses, which is this one shown here. There's also some pretty amazing marine mammals. It's got lots of, of, um, uh, of elephant seals that over summer here, they, they shed their skin, as you can see in this. And this photo and like on South Georgia and Antarctica you can get you can get you can observe them close okay perhaps not this close this photographer might have been a, a little too close but you can see them and then also they have amazing birds called striated caracaras they're known they're known locally as, as Johnny Rooks um, because they're thieves they steal anything and they really do do this if you put anything in front of them they'll steal it and when Charles Darwin went there they actually stole his hat uh, his gloves, uh, his wallet, and a load of other things. Um, they and I, I literally did this myself filming. It's amazing. They they steal anything that you put there. So um, it's a rugged, wild, windswept, but amazingly beautiful place. So I I really recommend leg nine. Leg ten heads back um, across the Magellan Straits into the Magellan Straits across into into Punta Arenas back. Um, down ready for the Chilean fjords. This is another spectacular leg. Obviously it'd be amazing to see the, the silhouette of South America appear on the horizon. Then obviously going into the Straits itself. It's a brilliant area for spotting whales. Um, obviously the coastlines are very well known for, for South American fur seals and sea lions as well. So you've got a really good, well, you, you, will, you will see them definitely. Um, and quite a few species of penguins as well. 
and, and you'll get albatrosses you know, flying over as well. Um, not so many on land because obviously it's continental and there's a lot of predators, but you'll certainly see them flying and, and, and around the vessel, particularly on the approach to South America. Um, this whole part, this whole area around Punta Arenas is this rugged wilderness that was settled for mining towns, mainly in the 19th century. Very rugged, very, very sort of sort of gaucho-ish culture in that sense, you know, wild, wild plains and, and very, very interesting little remote towns and so forth. And of course, getting to, to Punta Arenas itself, really colorful, interesting place. The next leg um, is a real highlight. Um, goes from Punta Arenas through the Chilean fjords, which obviously are, are among the most beautiful parts of South America, all the way up the coast of Chile to Concepcion. Um, this is quite a long leg, as you may be able to see from the dates, just shy of two weeks. And um, yeah, it goes through some of the most beautiful waters um, in, in, the, in South America. So the Chilean fjords, as, as, as you may know, dripping with glaciers and white peaks, and they're home to really beautiful so-called bonsai forests, which Darwin studied. These are stunted trees because of the climate. And um, yeah, Darwin was really struck by them and the beauty of them. In fact, we'll, we'll pass in the shadow of Mount Darwin, uh, which Captain Fitzroy named after Darwin because he was so taken by this beautiful place. We'll definitely pass uh, and see um, lovely colonies of shags and cormorants um, and penguins as well. And of course, the old fur seals and sea lions can't get away from them. And so we see lots of those. And almost certainly, there's very, very good places to see whales, especially as we get towards Chiloe, which is um, one of the larger islands along the coast of Chile, famous for its witches and folklore. It's a really colorful place. So obviously, time and, and weather allowing, it'd be lovely if, if we're able to, to stop briefly there or pass, or certainly pass close to it as well. So it's a really interesting place. Okay, heading a little further up the coast, got a relatively short leg um, from Concepcion to Valparaiso. These legs up the, the west coast of South America are perhaps the less well-known ones, but they, they, they give you the opportunity to go to some really little traveled and little, little visited parts of South America and see places where, where tourists normally don't, don't see so often and go so often. And I really mean that this, this beautiful coastline, particularly as we get further north to Atacama. Obviously, yeah, relatively few people sail up and down this, this coast, especially in a, in a spectacular historic tool ship. So you, you can imagine the, the landscapes and the shots that we see going along the coastline and obviously getting more and more arid as we go further north, passing some, some really significant um, marine mammal populations. And, and as we get north, you'll see pelicans and so forth, finally getting to the historic and the really interesting town of Concepcion. Um, all righty, the next leg is heading all the way up uh, to Valparaiso, for, sorry, from Valparaiso to Cayo. So Valparaiso, I should add, of course, is, is the seaport of, um, of Santiago. So those getting off at Valparaiso have a really easy connection out to Santiago and vice versa. Anyone arriving in uh, for this leg can, can fly into Santiago and there's, there's really good connections. And likewise for Cayo as well, there's, that's basically the seaport for Lima. Um, so anyone leaving at the end of this leg can fly out from Lima and anyone joining for leg 14 can arrive into Lima. So it makes it really convenient. This leg is, is I think one of the, the really interesting ones along the, the west coast of South America. Obviously we'll be skirting the coast and the fringes of the Atacama into some really remote areas, really, really interesting parts of this coastline that, again, very few people get to see up close. Um, really spectacular. Obviously, as we do go further north, it'll get more and more arid. Um, yeah, imagine dry, spectacular, dry, semi-arid, semi-desert plains with, with cacti fringing the, the rocky shores and views into the interior, really spectacular um, interior landscapes which Darwin uh, briefly explored as well. Um, as we go further, further north, of course, you'll see lots of different wildlife. Um, and then finally, of course, yeah, we, 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 get, we get to our destinations, uh, which you'll be able to then explore the really interesting town of Lima um, from Cayo, just up, up inland a little bit. So good connection there. Okay, Net leg 14 
sets up for the next, the, the big one, which is leg 50. Leg 14 goes from Kyle to Puerto Lucia, um, which, which is the last stop in mainland South America before we head out to the Galapagos. This is a really interesting leg as well because we're, we're getting into lush forests as we head further north. So the coastline will change pretty dramatically from semi-arid, arid Atacama to all the way up into lush coastal forests around Puerto Lucia. And again, beautiful, beautiful opportunities for, for whale watching from the sides of the ship. Um, certainly dolphins, many species of dolphins and a lot of seabirds and marine mammals. And just be really interesting passing those remote little fishing villages that's sort of forgotten on this part of the, the west coast of South America. We get into Puerto Lucia, resupply, refuel, obviously, and then head out for the, the iconic leg, which is leg 15, Puerto Lucia to Galapagos. I mean, obviously, this, this leg barely needs, barely needs explaining, but, but um, here we go. Darwin actually went to four of the Galapagos Islands. Um, he went to Santiago, Isabella, um, Floriana and San Cristobal. Um, we've budgeted some extra days on the journey in, depending upon permits and, and, and um, what we're allowed to do, whether we're allowed to sail directly between the islands or, or use local operators to explore them. We've budgeted a few days to go between them though, um, and it will explore obviously what we can. And again, um, this leg hardly needs explanation, the spectacular landscapes of the Galapagos and the, the unique wildlife that obviously arrested Darwin's interest to such an extent, from marine iguanas, to giant tortoises, um, to, to penguins, some of the world's only subtropical penguins, um, to shore crabs, grapsis crabs, uh, marine, again, more marine iguanas, of which there's been more species described, I believe, a couple of years ago, uh, frigate birds, and, and many, many, many other species. Well, the last leg for this evening um, is leg 16, and this leg still has a few places available. And to really underline it, you, this leg is epic. It goes between two of the world's best and most amazing groups of islands. I'm really surprised that there's still places left on this one. Um, I thought, I think we've got three or four left. I thought this would be snapped up overnight. So anyone still deciding, this is an epic one. You get the best of both worlds. You get to explore the Galapagos at the start, sail across the spectacular Pacific to Easter Island, Rapa Nui. And obviously, as you can see from the dates here, it's about two weeks. Um, Easter Island, kind of like the Galapagos, doesn't really need ex explanation in the sense that it's world famous and iconic. It's home to the Rapa Nui and the Moai, these spectacular heads of which I, I believe, if I'm correct, there's several hundred. I think there's about 300 scattered across the island. Um, I, I might be incorrect on that number, but it, it's a significant number. It's more than you would, would normally think. They're spectacular and interesting. The, and the island itself obviously has, has several hundred years of, of fascinating um, Polynesian heritage and, and history. So a, an incredible end destination to go to. And just like all of the destinations that we planned in this voyage, there's easy connecting flights back out, back to mainland South America. So if you're wondering what on earth you do when you get to Easter Island, don't worry, there's, there's regular flights back out uh, to the mainland um, every day, in fact, I believe. So, um, so that's nice and easy. So um, those are legs nine to 16. Do check online for our last um, voyage question and answer session, where you can see legs one to eight. And our next session will we'll have the next date. So thank you very, very much for listening and please join Darwin200.com or um, DutchTourship.com and be part of this voyage and choose the leg that you'd like to join. So I'll hand back over to the wonderful Elvira. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. I forgot <laughs> to explain a little bit uh, about maybe the I don't know, the rules. Uh, if you have a question, there are uh, several ways you can uh, raise the uh, questions. Uh, and that's by uh, putting them in the chat box um, or you can hold up your hand and hope someone that, that I will spot you or at the bottom uh, of your screen, there's a, uh, you can click on uh, reactions and raise your hand. Then, uh, then we can answer the, uh, your questions. Uh, I'm just going to 
can you, uh, Stuart, uh, stop the... Oh, I'm so sorry. Because then I have a bigger <laughs> sorry. <of> screen. Because <laughs> uh, I was wondering if Gerben is uh, available, our captain. Um, because I think there are a few new faces. So it might be nice to have a short introduction about Oosterschelde as well. And who knows? Oh, yes. Uh I will unmute you, Gerben. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. No, I didn't want to speak. Uh, but I, I raised my hand in two ways, but you didn't see it. So uh, you have to be uh, persistent. <laughs> good evening. Uh, I'm Gerben. I'm uh, one of the captains of Oosterschelde. I'm also uh, the managing uh, director of the company. And um, um, with Stuart, together with Stuart, uh, we uh, developed this plan, the plan of Stuart, and made this into this this uh, voyage that we all hope to be uh, uh, an epic one. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, every day I hear more about it, I get more excited. And uh, I have to um, tell you, this is not the first uh, trip I will uh, going to make, but it's really, really, really special. Um, for the new phases, we have um, the other uh, Q&A sessions. We started with some um, <clears throat> pictures and uh, a story about the ship. Um, you can read that and hear that all back on the, uh, the previous uh, recordings. Um, I'll keep it brief uh, this time. Um, uh, when Stuart uh, and me first met, that was on board uh, Oosterschelde. I invited him on board in uh, Scheveningen um, because he was looking for a ship that was uh, uh, willing to do uh, such an amazing trip. Um, I, on my hand, uh, I'm, I, I've, I've been working for Oosterschelde for many years. And uh, we restored that ship. It's a, it's a, it's not just a sailing ship. It's just not just a sailing ship company. We are, uh, we are only there to keep this ship alive. It's a, it's a, it's a, a very um, special ship. There were about 500 of them in the Netherlands uh, early uh, uh, last uh, century, and uh, Oosterschelde is the only one uh, remaining. So we thought we have to make sure that this ship, which is almost uh, 105 years old now, we have to keep her uh, uh, in good state for the next 105 years, or at least uh, 25, or at least uh, well, as far as I can get. And um, that was 30 years ago. So, uh, well, it's not 100 yet, but uh, we're doing good. Um, this ship is, is, uh, is restored. It's been restored with the help of many uh, sponsors, with people like you and me that, uh, that did some work without uh, payment or just... Uh, um, uh, gave advices or whatever. So many people helped us to restore the vessel. And so we feel as a company, Elvira is working for the company, I'm working for the company. Of course, the crew of the ship is working for the company. We feel a big, um, how do you say, in, um, responsibility to keep this beautiful ship as beautiful as it is and keep her in a good state. Having said that, um, a ship in a port is uh, very beautiful to look at and make a picture of but it will slowly, slowly go down. So one, the, the, the main thing, our philosophy is, if you want to keep the ship sailing for a long time, uh, if you want her to, to, to be in a good state, you have, to, uh, you have to sail with her. You have to go around and you have to uh, build on your group of friends uh, every day. And that means that we, from the beginning, we said we uh, want to... Uh, we want to conquer the world. We want to do sailing trips that, uh, that matter. And um, so... Uh, Already uh, a few years after the restoration of ship, we made the first circumnavigation of the uh, of the world with her, um, in, uh, including a visit to Antarctica, to Japan, to Indo uh, Indonesia, New Zealand, Australia, and so many years later, we kept on doing it. So when um, uh, making uh, kept on making um, uh, beautiful voyages to, to, well, to, we went to Svalbard in the North Pole, we went to the, the Gulf of Mexico, to the United States, we went to Canada, we, were, we did so many uh, to Russia, well, not so nice anymore, but in those days it was uh, special. And um, so when Stuart came to me with this uh, question, I immediately said yes, although <laughs> there was quite a bit of work to do. Um, so I can only promise you, um, we will do it, we will do it, we will get it done, we will go around and make this uh, beautiful voyage. And I can assure you, you will be on a very good ship, a very beautiful ship, and a ship that is in a very good state. And uh, well, that's my job, and I will uh, make sure uh, uh, you won't be disappointed on that. 
Great. Thank you, Gerben. Um, well, I have, uh, we received a few questions uh, by email. So maybe we can start with that. The first one is from Karen. She's in the, I saw her already. Um, I have a practical question about the watch system on board. Can you tell us a bit more on the role of the passengers on board and how we can take part in the watch keeping and the watch system? Yeah, yeah. Um, we like to, um, of course, the, there is a crew, a professional crew on board. They, uh, uh, they are there to, to, to make sure that everything is safe and uh, that there is enough knowledge on board. But actually their role is to guide the other uh, people on board, you, um, in the daily work of the ship. Um, and especially with the longer voyages, you will feel that every guest on board is every day more and more part of the crew. You will be invited to help with everything. Um, it's not a military ship, so there is no, um, how do you say, corvée? I don't know the word for that. Uh, there's no, um, um, we don't force you to do dishes. We don't uh, ask you to, to, to clean toilets. Of course, you can help us if you, if you want to, but that's not necessary. But we will ask you to be there on watch to help us with everything that's to be done in watch. And some watches are boring. You are just standing there, the wind is good. Um, you have to, well, nothing, nothing to change. The, the wind is stable, the, the, the sails are there. You only have to steer. So that's what we do. We steer every 20, 20 minutes, we change healthmen. Every, every hour we put a position in the chart and we put a position in the logbook. Um, we do some uh, small maintenance if we can, splice a rope or change a, a block, things like that. Uh, we climb uh, the rigging and see if everything is good. We have many uh, little uh, jobs during sailing that can be done during sailing. And if you like that, you can uh, join us with that. But all of a sudden, the wind might change. There may be a, 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 a tempest coming or there may be some, some uh, change of weather or in the force of the wind. And that means we have to adjust the sails to reef them or put extra sails up or change course or uh, even tech or jibe or doing a bigger maneuver with the ship. And the watch on deck is there to assist with everything that's needed for that. So that's the idea. You, if you're on the watch, you are there to be uh, to, uh, to to help the, the the rest of the crew with every maneuver that has to be done at that moment. After your watch, you have time to uh, spend for yourself. That means um, you can read, you can sleep, you can do anything. But if you want to be on deck and help as well, that's also good. So it's not like you, you can only help in these hours. No, you can help always, but you have to be there those hours that you're appointed to. We usually have three watches. That means after every watch of four hours, you have two watches off. So generally that will be four hours on, eight hours off. Sometimes we change a bit and we have six hours off and then we go on so that you're not always have the same watch uh, hours. And especially on longer voyages, we sometimes also uh, change the, 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 the watches. Otherwise, you're always with the same group of people in one watch, and then we make it, uh, uh, well, a little change just for the fun of it. Um, is that enough explanation? Yeah, there was a follow-up question, and you sort of answered it almost. Uh, the follow-up question was, how does it work with the guests that share a cabin? Are they assigned to the same watch or to a different one? That uh, depends on the uh, captain, but also on these uh, uh, people uh, themselves. If you are there with a good friend, I can imagine it's nice to share a cabin and also to be in the same watch because you are on holiday with your friend or, or girlfriend or wife or whatever. But if you are um, in a cabin, sharing a cabin with somebody you don't know, it may even be nicer to, to not to be in the same watch because that means you have the cabin for your own when you go to sleep because the other one will be on watch at that time. So that's, that we make the watch system uh, prior to the, to the voyage and we can always uh, adjust. So it's, it's, it's a matter of uh, uh, rostering. In, in, in fact, you, we, it, it's like a, a, a game. We, we make three watches and if we want to change uh, later on, we will just do that. Um, the watch hours, um, they always, let's say the change of watches is always um, at the time that there is a, a meal. We have a, a, a chef on board, of course, and he cooks the meals. And let's say typically we have three, three fixed meals, like the, the breakfast, the, the, the um, um, how do you call it? Uh, Middageten, come here. 
Lunch. Lunch and then the dinner. And uh, these, uh, these times are eight o'clock in the morning, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon and eight o'clock in the evening. In between, we serve also some, some food and, and, and tea and coffee, whatever you want. But those times are hours that the watches will change. So that's the idea. Okay. Um, then a question maybe Matthias uh, can help us with. Uh, can you tell us which legs are full? I can. Uh, as of this moment, legs 11, the Chalin Fjords, uh, the Galapagos Islands, of course. Um, leg 16, almost. Well, and almost everything in the uh, Pacific. Only some birds left on leg uh, 17, for example um and 21 and uh, unfortunately for the ones that applied for it of uh, cape horn around cape horn and uh, south georgia from cape to cape is uh, also are also fully fully booked as yeah, of this moment but we are and that might be an answer to daryl's question in the chat working with a wait list and since the voyages will be in one two or even uh, three years uh, well, there is a chance, of course, that people uh, who apply and are placed on the wait list will uh, be well be in a position to join us later on. Um, well, we we don't have a fixed number of people we uh, we will have on the wait list, but it depends a bit. I mean, if you're, for example, the seventh person, but there's a couple in front of you that, of course, don't want to join. Uh, when we have only one bird available or uh, since we work with um, uh, separate cabins for males and females and um, you're the first female, well, then th the place on the wait list is not that fixed in stone for your chances to join, of course. Yeah, and if you want of course to know... We will not have, oh. Yeah, oh, sorry. I wanted to add that if you want to know on any of the legs that you're interested in on, well... Uh, how long the wait list is, we can of course tell you, that's not a problem, but no. so far we don't have 20 people on the wait list uh, on any of the on any of the legs. No, and we will all, of course advise you well, there are 20 in front of you of which 10 are uh, single travelers and male, yeah, then it's your decision to make whether you will uh, well, hold your place on the wait list or join us on another voyage. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Matthias. Um, and and by, by no means are necessarily the best legs gone. There's some really amazing legs still still available. So no, re really don't for a second think all the best ones have been snapped up. Um, it's actually been really surprising which ones have, have been, been, been booked and which haven't. And some of the best ones of all, like the, one, the, two, the two that stand out for me are the Falklands one and the, the, the leg between um, leg 14, sorry, 16 between Galapagos and Easter Island. I'm astounded that those two haven't already been, there's a few places on both. So don't think the best ones have gone, they definitely haven't. Um, in fact, some of the best ones of all still have the places, so hope you join them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gerben, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I wanted to add something because um, we, um, well, also this session, we talk a lot about the destinations and uh, the place to start and the destination, which is of course a, a big part of your voyage. Um, uh, because that's the area that you're going to visit. But um, f seen from a sailing point of view, some, um, some other um, um, legs may be very interesting as well. I, I personally, for example, I like the legs that travel uh, several uh, um, climate zones, for example. That's interesting. As a seaman, it's interesting to see the weather change, to see how the, the, the wind uh, is, is connected to the, to the weather systems. And so if you're in, in, into that kind of things, then an, a long ocean crossing, traveling uh, some climate change could be very, very inter interesting to you. So I would also recommend you to, if you're hesitating or if you don't know what to choose, just uh, call us or uh, write us an email and ask, this is what I'm hoping for. Where can I find it? In which leg could I find it? And then I can advise you which leg to, to take because it may be something different than you first thought of. That's what I wanted to add. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, then uh, arriving at the destination, is it possible, possible to stay on board a few days? Stuart, maybe, or Gerben? I 
yeah, yeah, I can easily ask that. No, that's not possible. The whole, um, the whole um, Darwin 200 project is not only a sailing from A to B to C to D, is about the Darwin 200 project. Um, and Darwin, uh, oh, sorry, Darwin, Stuart can tell a little bit more about the project itself, but it means that in the stopovers in the different ports, we will have young uh, environmentalists on board doing their, their things, which is part of the, that. That means uh, that you cannot stay any longer than you are, um, than you are uh, reading now in the, in the let's say, um, how do you say that? in the itinerary, eh? so you, you can't book an extra day on board, but we do recommend everybody to, um, to actually book a hotel or a pension or whatever in the place where we uh, end and uh, perhaps also in the place where we start because that adds to the, the whole um, uh, idea of the voyage of course. And, I, and we go, uh, we come back to that subject a bit later, this Q and A, because that's why we actually made this community pages. We want to add a lot of information about, uh, 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 about every destination, about every city or place that we're gonna visit, including places to stay, including the climate, including interesting things to see, to visit, including how to get there or how to get away from it so that we can um, actually um, uh, share this information with everybody of you and if you have information on the same subject please share it with us and with your fellow travelers so that we can um, have the time that the ship is in port you are still around then but maybe not uh, staying on board but still uh, in the in the region that we visit yeah thank you um Specifically for the next leg that goes past Pitcairn Island, do you actually go ashore or just have the islands come out to you to interact on Oosterschelde? If you go ashore, is it for a new a few hours or are you there for more than a day? Yeah, um, you don't. If you do an ocean crossing, it's uh, you see a lot of sea, you see a lot of water, but once you go to an island, you don't go there for a few hours. You stay there, you want to be there in time and you want to spend um, the most of the time you have on this island and then you have to go on again. So it will be definitely more than a few hours, of course. And uh, if I will be on board on that leg, I will certainly not pass Spitcairn without stopping there. <laughs> I can't, can't do that. <laughs> I think these, um, I mean, I have a strange profession and I started as a, as a professional sailor and as a captain when I was young. And I think it, it's part because I read all these books, all these uh, Moby Dick, uh, um, the, the Mutiny on the Bounty, all these books and all these stories, they play in the Pacific. And now that we go there, I want to see every island. I want to, or we can't, of course, we can't. But yeah. if I pass one close enough, I will stop there. Yeah. And I will take you on land as well. Just, just a quick mention for those that don't know what Pitcairn is. Um, it's a UK overseas territory in the Pacific. Uh, I, I personally went there a few years ago. Um, when I went, it only had 47 people. It's often claimed to be the world's most remote inhabited island, along with Tristan de Kuna. And it's arguable which is the more remote and the more isolated. But as, as Gerben very kindly alluded to, it's home to the mutineers from the mutiny of the bounty, or rather I should say their descendants. So if you read the story of the mutiny on the bounty with Fletcher Christian and, and William Bly, all, literally all of the people on the island today are directly descended from the mutineers and they speak a very strange form of 18th century English with sailor speak like pirate talk, um, and there's wonderful traditions. They ring the bells on the island when they see a ship. Um, it's a very romantic place. It's a very interesting place. And it's got some really great culture. It's got Polynesian pictograms and standing stones. It's got some unique wildlife. It's a really cool place. So I share 100% Gavin's um, enthusiasm to visit. You'll fall in love with that island. It's, it's an amazing place. Yeah. <laughs> So that's in the next eight legs. So if you join for the next question and answer sessions, we've got a whole um, section of the PowerPoint all about pit cam. So I hope you join the next one. Uh, <laughs> cool. Ooh. Can you request a watch? I know not many people like the 12 to four, but I do and would happily take it. 
<laughs> All the time, really? <laughs> well, we try to make a watch system that uh, where we have rotating watches so that you don't, especially on longer voyages, that you don't always have the same watch. But of course, if you want to be uh, there the, 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 the most difficult hours of the day, then uh, you're happy. And uh, we are happy if you be there. But uh, normally we try to rotate because if, you're all, if you have always the same watch, uh, well, you miss the sunrise if you always see the sunset. So we try to make everybody part of the whole uh, experience. And um, it's an interesting question or an inter interesting remark because many, if I sail on the ocean uh, and I ask these people, how many of you uh, did, the sun, uh, did see the, the, the sunrise uh, the past year? or the past two years, then many of them says, no, no, no. Yeah. Many people don't see that anymore. They don't know how it is anymore. How many times have you seen the, the moon rise from the sea or go down and see all these things? And so these hours that, that sometimes seem to be uh, not so interesting, depending also, of course, the latitude where you are, um, could be very, very interesting. So we try to rotate this uh, watch uh, schedule. <clears throat> Thank you. And there was a specific question about leg 28 that is currently fully booked indeed, but it is, we don't have a wait list there. So it uh, is, uh, if you're interested in that one, send an email, then we can uh, put you up and uh, maybe there will be some changes over the next few weeks. And if you would want to apply for additional legs, uh, if you can send us an email or if you should reapply on the website, no, just send us an email. If you already completed the whole booking form, then we have all your details, send us an email and then we can check availability for you. So that's not necessary. And then I had another email with a few questions. Let me get that one. Um, about the two, Darren 200 chip, I can't figure yeah. out whether they are for everyone or just uh, for 18 to 25 year olds. Okay, sorry if it's confusing. We're about to launch a, a, a brand new site, a brand new system on our site uh, concerning this. We, we've, we've had different levels of startup, basically. So to answer your question, um, there's several elements to the project. The first element is, is the Darwin leaders. They are 18 to 25, uh, top five year olds. Um, we're selecting the very best young top conservationists in their formative years and bringing them in groups to the ports, so to land um, between the voyage legs. So those are 18 to 25 year olds, and there'll be an app, there is a registration process already on the site, but there'll very shortly be an application process. So if you have any 18 to 25 year olds in your family that that um, that have done amazing things, we're, we're looking for people, not just anyone interested in conservation, but people that have gone out there and done incredible and amazing things. So that's the Darwin leader side of things. The second element is the world's most exciting classroom. Um, and this will be going to be rolling out an incredible um, range of activities that everyone can take part in. It's aimed at schools, but it'll be every week for a hundred weeks, nonstop. So, so throughout the two year voyage, um, every single week, new projects, new experiments, new competitions, new lectures, new question answer sessions, interviews with conservationists, a whole package every single week, systematically for 100 weeks, and everyone can take part in that. The, the third element um, is the Darwin Mentor Program. And again, we're going to be launching that in a few months time. Um, this is deliberately a little bit vague at this point as we're finalizing the details in the different ports. But yeah, we're potentially opening that up to a broader range of people as well. So um, just yeah, keep keep posted on the old Darwin 200 site, and um, we're going to be launching these different programs in great detail shortly. Yeah. Thank you, Stu. Thanks. Um, and the second question was: Currently, there are no trips shown between August 2022 and the start of the Darwin 200 a year later. Is this because you're taking a year out to prepare or will there be trips in this period, but they're just not confirmed yet? Gerben, or shall I do it? Oh, <laughs> yes, he's uh, nodding yes. Um, there will be trips. Um, we will be sailing up to August and then uh, 
we will be doing some uh, large maintenance in preparation, of course, of the, uh, the voyage, but it's also an ongoing process. Uh, during winter, we will be in uh, Cape Verde. So if you want to try out uh, and uh, get to know the ship beforehand, uh, it might be a really nice getaway uh, in winter time uh, to go to sunny uh, Cape Verde and sail with us. And then in spring, we will have a few trips in Europe, uh, so closer to home. And then, um, uh, well, I think uh, one month before we leave, we start with uh, really preparing for the, for the big voyage. So there will be more possibilities to join us beforehand, if you would want to. Okay, were there any more questions? Or stuff you would like to add? No, no one raising their hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, might be good if um, to tell everyone that while well, we're working, like Gerben already explained about on the uh, community pages to uh, to add all the information about the different uh, destinations. So um, uh, I think it will be up uh, somewhere next for this week, uh, right, Stuart? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So keep an eye on the community page. So just to explain that for everyone, so for every single leg, we've prepared detailed <laughs> information about how to fly to your start point and leave from your end point. So for some places, obviously, it's it's obvious, like Rio de Janeiro, but for other places like Ascension Island, that's only serviced by by military flights, you know, it, it's not so obvious. So um, so there's detailed information concerning the flights. Um, there's a bit of general information about temperature and climate, just so you can think a little bit about what to what to bring and what to prepare. There's some general information, particularly in the more remote locations, um, about hotels. Like, for example, again, on Ascension Island, there is just one hotel on the entire island. So a little bit of information about, about hotels and so forth. Um, and also, last but not least, um, some, some detailed information where relevant concerning what you can do in the start places and the end locations. So some activities and tours, just as an ideas, basically, to help you. Because as, as Gervin kindly mentioned, it's, it's, it's a good idea to, to arrive a few days before your voyage starts and to leave a few days afterwards, both to acclimatize, B, to, to, um, you know, to have a bit of buffer time because you don't want your flight to be delayed uh, arriving and, and then you miss literally miss the boat. And, um, and last but not least, because you're in such incredible places, it's kind of a shame not to enjoy them and, and see them a little bit. And then lastly, we've got a little bit of information for each leg about visas and currencies uh, and currencies and what it's like. Some locations, you, you know, you're recommended to, to bring cash and dollars and others, there's no ATMs and so forth. So we, we, we prepared that um, and we as I say, that's, that's nearly finished. So I believe we're launching that this week or next week. So um, stay tuned for that. And if obviously, if you have any further questions, just, just email. Great. Yeah, Gerben, you have a... Yeah, I wanted to add something because for us, um, we don't want to, uh, to write uh, a new uh, Lonely Planet and we don't want to be uh, competing the bread. Um, uh, what we want to do is give you the information that you are looking for uh, on these uh, uh, places of our destination. Um, if you miss something in the thing we prepare, pre please let us know. If you want to add something because you do know, uh, uh, you have your local knowledge, please also let us know. The whole idea about the community page is that we uh, collect the, the interesting information and share that amongst, uh, amongst us. It's new for us, so we will probably um, uh, let's give you too much information on, on, on one subject and too little on another. If we do, please let us know. We try to improve. Uh, um, well, and we have some time for that. Huh? We're, we're not uh, <laughs> leaving yet, but uh, we try to, to do that uh, the coming uh, months, starting next week. <laughs> yeah, okay. and if, uh, also on the community page, I can imagine if you're traveling all by yourself and you're traveling from Europe or from Australia to the South, uh, to South America, it might be nice to meet up or to, uh, to get in touch with fellow sailors beforehand. So um, that's why we created the whole community page that maybe you can meet up beforehand or, well, get in touch with each other. So uh, 
please feel free to do that. That uh, because it makes it more lively and uh, uh, well ha helps in the fun beforehand maybe as well. Yeah. So, uh, okay, well, I don't have any questions anymore, Stuart and Gerben and Matthias. So uh, <laughs> perfect. I think well, that we can uh, close up for. Well, a, a very, very big thank you to everyone for coming. Um, we hope this has been helpful in, in giving some information about the voyage. And certainly from, from my side, a, a huge thank you for everyone taking part in and joining this exciting voyage. We hope to, to see you all aboard. So thank you very, very much for coming this evening. Uh, thank you. Gerben, <laughs> you're on mute. Um, did you already announce? I had a phone call. Just uh, maybe you said it that we want to do the next meeting, oh, uh, yes. the July or not? Actually, sorry, no, we we didn't. That's a very good point. So everyone, if um, we're we're skipping the first of June, we're going to the first of July. So as, as you may know from the sites, seven o'clock GMT um, on the first of July is our next session. The details will be on our websites. Thanks for the reminder there, Gavin. I forgot to mention that. So that's great. So see you on the 1st of July. And a, recording, oh, yeah, sorry. a recording of this session will be online as well. So if you if you missed anything tonight or want to hear anything again, um, a recording will shortly be online. So a massive thank you for coming. <laughs>